just take a moment as, to make a few announcements, and then we'll take a break. But um, I want to commend the work of Ascension Press on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I did invest in one of their books in following Father Mike Schmitz, and he is doing a really good job online. And it's like you have somebody there with you reading the catechism and explaining. Um, it's probably not the, 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 the most scholarly, but it is certainly the most practical and effective. And it's a 20 minute investment. The next thing I want to do is, is for, actually it's open to both, to Catholics in general and to attorneys in particular. Um, so. I do have a, a flyer up here. It's, it, they are starting a St. Thomas More Society in Idaho. And this is to be commended across the country, but it's just getting started. And part of it is it's getting started in the Attorney General's office through the new Solicitor General. And he is an Orthodox Catholic out of Washington, D.C. So I'm really excited about that part of it. But anyway, if you're interested, I can give you the email address for the person who's getting started. They are inviting both attorneys and non-attorneys. Of course, St. Thomas More is, for those who do not recall, is a 16th century saint who battled a Henry VIII with regard to the nature of the church and refused to sign a parliament passed abdication of the church to the state rather than staying with Rome. Uh, he refused to, to sign it, it cost him his head. There's, some really, there's a really beautiful movie about him, and I commend you to, to see that, uh, because it tells the story quite well. And there's so many good dialogue in that movie that are actually response to some of the conditions that are going on in our own day as to obedience of the state. A Man for All Seasons? A Man for All Seasons, yes. Thank you. I, I slipped me, but I would in, encourage you to watch that movie. John, what's the, what's the mission of that uh, group? Uh, it's to turn the, the effect of is, is obviously to face the truth um, with regard to the law and the practice of the law and as, as citizens of a nation is to follow the law, particularly the natural law, and to study the nature of law, both natural law and civil law and how it impacts man, which one we need to follow with the other and, and the encouragement of the study of the law. And it's very Thomistic. Uh, we will get in, be getting into some of those aspects later today on the discussion with regard to justice. The next thing is I wanted to let you know that there are some uh, cards up here, for lack of a better word, holy cards, that kind of are talking about the Rosary Pilgrimage this year for 2023, and which started the 1st of February. And I encourage you to, to grab one of these and follow it. They do have a link on here to the website and it's going on across the United States. It's sponsored by the Friars uh, of the Dominican Fathers of St. Joseph which is out of DC, the Dominican House of Studies. So grab one of those. This is very important and the, there, I don't know how much you keep up on it but the prayer for peace is effective, it's efficacious and important. Um, I fear that if we head into it's just my opinion. I'm going to express it. I do not want to go to war. I don't want this nation to go to war. We need to pray. Seriously. Okay. And so we're also once later, probably between talks, we want to give a talk with regard to access to the groups I O a little later. And also note that last month we purchased, and I have some up here, that are books that the chapter is going to be using in the months ahead, particularly this one, right? And this one is, are we going to be using this one, Knowing God? Or, okay. For those who don't have it, you can grab it. Grab one. The, the chapter has bought it for you. And we will be using it as a resource. Those who online who don't have it or have access to it, we will have it sent to you. But please send me uh, an email, john at keenan.org and I'll make sure it gets sent to you. Um, and anyway, uh, we continue to pray and work towards
good things and all the blessings be with all of you. And I'm very thankful to be a part of, of this great, this good chapter and uh, thankful you're here. Thank you. Any questions at all? All right. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the life of Praxedes Fernandez. She was a wife, mother, widow, and lay Dominican. She lived in Spain. Um, she was born in 1886. She died in 1936. So she lived through the Spanish Revolution, and she lived in the heart of it. So she, it directly affected her life, right at the end of it. Okay. Um, oh, and also I found out that... Um, just yesterday, Pope Francis declared her venerable in 2014. So I thought she was servant of God, but she's elevated. Perfect. Okay, so she lived in the Valley of Mires, which was the heart of the coal mining industry in Spain. Uh, she was born into a Catholic family, and from her parents, she had an ideal example of marriage. She was very faithful and pious, even from her childhood. And she always had a very generous heart for the poor and sick from the time she was a child all the way to her end of her life. Um, when she was 12 years old, the Dominican sisters established a school in her village and she attended it. So she was educated by Dominicans. Um, so her whole life, very pious, very prayerful, very charitable. Naturally, she was attracted to the religious life. She wanted to become a nun. She wanted to live in the convent but her father didn't want her to. Uh, he wanted her to get married, and she obeyed his wish. So she put her, her desires aside, obeyed her father, but she was very picky about her husband. It took her a long time. She went through many suitors, she declined them, and she finally settled on a man named Gabriel, who was a minor, and her family did not like him. He was very poor, and her family was very wealthy. So she dropped significantly in her social class by marrying him, and her family never liked that, and this would go on to affect the rest of her life. Um, so Gabriel also had a really terrible temper. He was not a very nice person. He was prone to anger, and he was very violent. Um, he never was physically abusive, but um, he was seen slapping her once in public, which is the worst that was ever seen. Um, but she remained very docile and very obedient to her husband despite his temper. Um, and she was 28 years old when she married him. She waited a while because she was really taking her time. Okay, so her married life. As a wife, Praxedes never wavered in her resolve to fulfill her duties to her married state. She took it very seriously. She knew that her sanctification was going to come from her obedience to the daily duties of her life. Um, she saw God's will in all situations, even the most ordinary, and that is what she clung to as her path to holiness. So she was very determined to carry all the crosses of married life and motherhood with fortitude and by being resigned to God's will. She very diligently attended her home. She, everyone said that her house was always spotless. She never slacked in her responsibilities to her home, to her husband, to her children, and she carried out her pious practices of prayer and penance. Um, so the married state did not distract her from her piety. It actually helped her to comply with it even better. Um, her front porch was surrounded by windows, and she would sit out on the front porch and sew. She sewed all the clothes for the whole family, and so she sewed a lot, and she always sat on the front porch to sew. And so all the neighbors could see her sewing all the time, and they commented, uh, one neighbor commented, I always had the impression that Praxedes was interiorly praying while she sewed. And her sister said, when we used to sew together, she hardly spoke. It was easy to see that she was completely recollected with God. So very much like St. Catherine of Siena, she maintained that, um, what's it called, the, the cloister of the heart, that interior disposition, um, despite what she was doing. So she had a lot of responsibilities at home, but she remained 
prayerful while she was working. Um, she also only left home if it was necessary. A neighbor said of her, do you see that woman? She leaves her home only to go to church and to get water from the spigot. She never wastes time visiting or talking to anyone. So her duty to her married state was everything to her. Her, du her duty was at home, so she remained home. And she didn't allow worldly things to distract her, which is um, very Dominican. If you read the old, the older rule, I can't remember which one. I think it's the one from the 20s. Um, it says that Dominicans should primarily stay home, <laughs> not be distracted by like worldly dances and that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so Praxedes and Gabriel had a pretty happy marriage despite his, his temper, but their happiness did not last because Gabriel was tragically killed in a train accident just six years into their marriage. At this point, she had four sons. Her oldest was five years old, and her youngest was two weeks old. So she was still on bed rest, recovering from childbirth when he was killed. And here she is now, a widow, with four small boys and no money, because they were completely poor. So she had no choice um, away before I get to that. So after um, a relative came to give her sympathies, the relative said of Praxedes, I never saw such conformity to God's will as hers. What patience, I have never seen anyone like her. So in the midst of her suffering of losing her husband, she was completely resigned to the will of God. But there was one thing that caused her pain, and that was that her husband had died very suddenly. So no priest, um, no opportunity to prepare for death, no sacraments before death, and she was very worried about the state of his soul when he died. Um, however, she was blessed with a very extraordinary sign of assurance. She always had masses said for him for years and years and years. Well, nine years <coughs> after his death, she was having a mass said for the repose of his soul, and she was in bed at night, and she heard footsteps climbing up the ladder on the side of the house. And at first she thought it was one of her sons. But the sound of the footsteps did not stop. It just kept going and going and going. Um, it seemed as if the ladder was just going on indefinitely. And she realized those are not human footsteps and this is not a physical ladder. Um, so then she got really scared. And the, the ascent lasted for 15 minutes. She heard these climbing steps on the side of the house. And then they became more distant and they disappeared. And then an overwhelming sense of peace filled her and she realized it was her husband's footsteps climbing out of purgatory and into heaven. And in regards to her sons, she said that she had no worries at all because she had given them over to the Blessed Mother. So in the midst of her sorrow, she enjoyed great peace because she believed her family was under the protection of the Blessed Mother and that she would always care for them. Okay, so now she's a poor widow. She had no choice but to go home and live with her mother and her sister. By this time, her father had died. Her sister, Florentina, was extremely cruel to her. Her mother was fine, um, but because of Praxida's lower social status, Florentina treated her pretty much like a slave. Uh, she became like a Cinderella in the house. Uh, she was the housekeeper, the cook, she did all the cooking and cleaning, and she waited on the whole house like a servant. But she didn't resent the condition, and she actually enjoyed it because it made her feel closer to Mary, who is the handmaid of the Lord. Um, so now her life became very busy. She's like a single mother to four little kids, and she's now basically like a servant to her mother and sister. But despite all of her work, she always found time for her private devotions. <clears throat> her cousin said that she used to get up very early to be in her housework. If we ever invited her to the theater, she excused herself and said that her duties do not allow her the time. She would even counsel me to stay home more so that I could pay more attention to my husband and children. Um, it was common knowledge among her family and neighbors that she devoted herself to her pious devotions, despite the activity of her daily duties. <coughs> Florentina lived with her for her whole widowhood, and she said that 
Praxedes loved to pray, and she took plenty of time for that, but never neglected her duty. She slept very little and was always up very early. And Praxedes once advised a cousin, the time it takes to assist at mass is not an impediment. It actually serves to help you do your duties better. So she was advising her cousin to, no matter how busy you are, take time for mass, because it will help you. And she once told her son, Enrique, he's the one that became a Dominican priest, um, ever since I heard a sermon about St. Zita, that she went about her domestic duties thinking of God, I always do the same. She had a deepening of her Eucharistic devotion when she became acquainted with a new bishop. His name was Bishop Malaga. And he was known as the Bishop of the Tabernacle because he encouraged and inspired a deeper love for Jesus hidden in the tabernacle. And when she came to have this stronger Eucharistic devotion, she began to attend three Masses a day. Um, the first one she would offer in preparation for receiving the Eucharist, the second one she would receive the Eucharist, and the third one she would give thanksgiving for receiving the Eucharist. And she did that every day, three Masses every morning. Uh, during this time in her life, Mass and Communion became indispensable. Nothing could keep her from going to Mass and receiving the Eucharist. So no matter the weather, she made it a priority. Um, she also believed that the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass was the best prayer um, to pray for the salvation of her family as well as for all of mankind. So this was, um, at this point it's the 1930s, I think about 1931. And the revolution in Spain was pretty active and gearing up. Um, there was a time where she was unable to receive communion because of the persecution of the church. And she said that the days without the Eucharist were like days without the sun. In addition to the three masses a day, she would then go visit the Blessed Sacrament in adoration again later in the day. Um, okay, so in 1931, she experienced another tragic loss, but it shows again her complete resignation to God's will. She lost one of her sons in another train accident. Um, upon hearing the news, she began to sob and cried out, yes, in this world I too must suffer as Christ suffered. So she accepted the suffering the same way she did all her other sufferings, by submitting herself to God's will. And a priest came to visit her, and she told him, my son was not mine, but God's, who is his only owner. He has chosen to take him back. All I have to do is be content with God's holy will. Um, one of her sons brought her some money to buy flowers, maybe for his grave or something, and um, she refused the money. And she said, flowers will wilt and die. It is better to use that money for masses for his soul. And she had a lot of masses said for him. She paid the stipend for 30 masses. And she was given another extraordinary gift when she was attending a mass that was being said for her son. She saw a vision of her son in the arms of the Blessed Virgin, and uh, Mary had wrapped him in a scapular. And after that, she told her other sons never to take their scapulars off because it was the devotion that had saved their brother. Okay, so... When did she become a lay Dominican? Well, actually, uh, at first she wanted to be a Carmelite. She read the works of St. Teresa of Avila, was very inspired by them and loved them, and she actually practiced the Carmelite rule at home on her own because she couldn't join a Carmelite convent. It was in 1934 that her son Enrique became a Dominican novice, so he was on his way to becoming a Dominican priest, and more and more she began to feel a closeness to the Dominican order. And the sisters in the village, uh, she told them that she didn't feel worthy to be a Dominican, but she did go through uh, with becoming part of the Third Order. And she took the name Catalina after St. Catherine of Siena. And at this time, the sisters loaned her a copy of St. Catherine's Dialogue, which really inflamed her love of the church even more. Um, so as a lay Dominican, and even before, she practiced really great acts of penance. Um, like I said before, she lived in the immediate vicinity of the Spanish Revolution, so the church was greatly repressed. Many laws against the church, um, the churches were being burned down, sacred things were being desecrated, 
priests were being murdered. Uh, but she was, she was very faithful to the church during these times, and she never got angry. She never wanted revenge on the people who were persecuting the church. And she even would visit the sick despite their political leanings. So even people who she knew hated Catholicism, if they were sick, she would still go and visit them. Um, so she maintained a deep sense of charity despite this political tension. And she also practiced many austere forms of penance uh, because she believed that her acts of penance would make reparation for not only her own sins, but the sins of the whole world. So that was very important to her. Um, okay, so shortly after the revolution in 1936, she became very sickly. She had dysentery and was vomiting. She tried to continue to do her usual work around the house, but her family realized how sick she was. They told her to stay in bed. Uh, but she still snuck out of bed to attend her three daily masses against the will of her family and the doctor. She even um, stuffed pillows under the blanket to make it look like she was in bed because she didn't want to miss mass. Uh, but eventually her condition worsened and she became gravely ill. She became bloated. She was in constant pain. The doctor came and told her she needed to stay in bed. He told her even to stop speaking. That, um, but they, they kind of all knew that death was coming. Uh, because she wasn't able to speak, she wasn't able to pray the rosary out loud, and that distressed her a great deal. So she asked her family to come in and pray the rosary out loud, and she would follow along with them in her head. Um, she died with her arms <clears throat> in the form of a cross and with her rosary in her hand. Now, it had been her wish at some point to be buried in the Carmelite habit, and so her family wanted to respect that, but they were not able to find one. But they found a Franciscan habit. So they actually buried her in that, <laughs> and they placed a Dominican scapular over it. So thus, in her death, she was embraced by the two great patriarchs, Dominic and Francis. So that's the end. It's published by Tan. This was published in 1987. I bought a used copy off of Amazon. Tan does not publish it anymore, but you can get an ebook from their website. Did, did you say what she was sick with? I didn't hear. Oh, it started with dysentery and then just got worse and never got worse. Non of citrus? Is that, what's dysentery? Dysentery is a. Is that a disease contaminated water? Yeah. yeah. Oh, That's what I thought. Yeah. Water. Yeah. yeah, so she probably got some kind of infection in her bowels, and I okay. think this was before antibiotics. Yeah. yeah. A war torn country that's actually quite strong. Yeah, and it mentioned that she didn't have great access to medical care. There was a doctor, but it also said that her medical care wasn't good because of the war. Questions? Yeah, a couple, two questions. Uh, first of all, what, what drew you to her? Uh, is this kind of random or something? And then it felt all, random, yeah. but I think it was God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my mother gave me a book about suffering that I was reading, and it was written by a woman who lost a child. And in her grief, she began to study the sufferings of the saints and how they coped with their sufferings. So each chapter is about a different saint. And second chapter, it was about her. And I had never heard of her, but it mentioned she was a wife, a mother, a widow, and a lay Dominican. And I've got three of those. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really interested. So I found the book and read it. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. <clears throat> now, you, you said that she's recently been made a venerable. A venerable. Yeah, by Pope Francis. There's some pictures of her in there. Yes? Um, you mentioned the communist revolution and how she um, still went to people who hated the, the church. Mm -hmm. um, did she suffer any, anything during that uh, revolution? Yeah, um, there was a lot of animosity against Catholics at the time, and so I think because she was so charitable to the poor and the sick that even though she was Catholic, they they still let her come help because they, they really loved her because she loved them. 
And she even, I didn't mention this, but she would go and baptize babies. She would go to the dying and um, pray with them while they died because they didn't have access to priests. Um, so any way that she could help anyone with anything religious, she was there to help them. What happened to her son that became a Dominican? Um, Father Bart said that he was in Spain. Yes, and <clears throat> Father Bart said he traveled around the United States. Oh, Father Enrique yeah. Fernandez did? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, um, I'd have to look up his email, but he said that they <laughs> always look forward to his visit. Okay. And that he would come and give a talk, and if I recall directly, yeah. and that um, he was a blessing to everybody who heard his story, but he would tell the story of his mother at these talks and about how it, it impacted him. And I so, think he translated that book. Really? Yeah, so, he didn't write it, but I think he was responsible for the English translation. Did he have to flee Spain because he was studying to be a Not that I know of, it didn't mention it. I don't know if where he was studying. Well, the revolution was more in the north because it was uh, because it was a fight between the, it was a, what do you call it, a proxy war between the communists and the Nazis. But it also involved Spanish politics and the Basque. Mm. And so it was a very, it was not unlike one of the time because it became very political. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't take these public positions and stuff yeah. or you'd get in real deep trouble. That's why the point you made about her political position is important in light of not only today, but because she could not, it, it's uh, heroic for her to visit others despite their political positions, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, because, yeah. there you know, was one story in the <coughs> show that she baked like this really nice sweet cake and her mother was angry with her. And she said, what are you doing with that? And she said, oh, I'm gonna go give it to this old woman who was dying, and she said, I want her to receive last rites before she dies, so I'm going to bribe her with this cake to get her to receive the sacrament. <laughs> God uses many ways. Yes. <laughs> um, she wrote a lot of letters to her son when he was in the seminary. I think they have like 35 or 40 letters, and that's most of the material that was able for her to be, for her canonization to move forward, was what she wrote in those letters to her son. Very good. I would just need a miracle now. Yeah. Yeah, the next step is the beatified. And now you only need one miracle for that. Well, she's a third order to many. That's one. She is, yeah. Thanks, Emily. Oh, nice. Yes.